Authentication is a pretty tricky thing to get right. And it's been one of the most asked questions in the Solid Discord. So today we should probably do that. Welcome, I'm Achila and I'm a member of the Solid DX team. And today we're going to add authentication using only one dependency to handle the data, which is the data layer, because we don't have a database in Solid Start. Other than that, we're going to use the things that come either from our runtime or from the dependencies that are already packed in with Solid Start in a typical template. So the first idea that we need to get when creating auth in a Solid Start app is that Solid Start's not meant to protect routes. We Solid Start is built to protect data. So we are going to add our protection on the data that's being requested or not. So we're going to define what data the user has access, is authorized to access or not. We're not going to protect routes per se. That's the one thing that's tricky in comparison to the others. Other than that, let's see if we can get it as straightforward as possible. Let's stop wasting time and jump straight into the code. So welcome to this code base. We have a little app running over here that has a few different routes and it can log in and log out. And on the other side, we have VS Code Open. It's a solid start app and it has a few dependencies. The most important one of them is in storage for the database. Other than that is mostly UI stuff with uh, Tailwind and because we're using solid UI, uh, and we have also um, SolidJS Meta Router and Start on top of SolidJS, so it is a Solid Start app because we need the backend. On top of that, there isn't much special config. The only one that we have is for the middleware, which is the first thing that we are going to do now. We're going to set up a middleware that can protect us against CSRF. So on Solid Start, the way you declare a middleware is by passing the file over here, and that's going to be the entry file. So I like to call, to put that as an index inside the middlewares folder. And the middleware is going to have this index that is going to import a, as many middlewares as I need, one for request and the other for on response. And the CSRF protection is the one we are going to add right now. So we have a few types that are coming from Solid Start. Uh, it's re-exporting and we have a helper from Vinci, which is to fetch uh, the headers from our HTTP request. Other than that, I'll grab the host by using the URL that's present in a, in a header that I'm going to pass out as a string. And then I create a new URL instance and grab the host out of that or return no. After that, we have a verify request origin, which is going to take the origin that I want to check against a list of allow domains. If there's no allow domains, I'm just going to point blank block it. Otherwise, I'll store the origin of the request in this variable. If there is no origin request, I'll block it again. Other than that, I'll iterate through my list of allow domains. And if the origin and my server domain match, I'm going to allow this request to pass. Otherwise, I'm just going to block it again. This method is used inside this CSRF blocker, which, first of all, only runs if the request type is not a get, because the point of having CSRF protection is against data mutation. And please don't try to do mutations on a get request you might succeed, but they're not meant for that. And it's a really bad practice and unsafe. Then I'll grab the origin header. If the origin header is not present, so if you want to, su to support like really old browsers, you can use the referrer as well. I added this for you to know. And then I'll grab the host, which is my server domain. So these are only going to be undefined if these headers are actively being kept from the request. And that's going to be a red flag for my protection anyway. If any of them are undefined, I'm going to block it. If then the origin and the request don't match, I'm going to block it as well. And then my middleware looks like this. It's going to then grab the event and pass it to this blocker. If the blocker returns block, then 
it's going to be blocked. I'm going to send a response with a 403, which is a forbidden HTTP status. And I'm just going to stop the request right there. Otherwise, it's just going to fall through. And that's how we do CSRF protection using the request headers in this case. There are other ways to do that, uh, but this one is good enough for now. Now that we did our due diligence, and by the way, this is not the only header you need on your app, but uh, we're going to save the other ones for another moment. Now we can go and set up our database. So what we're going to do is go through the database folder and create a setup. The setup is going to use Node Crypto, which I can actually make this import a little bit better. And we're going to use unstorage as our data layer, and we're going to use the FS Lite provider. Then we create an interface for the password, which is going to have a hash and a salt. Never store passwords in plain text. Then we get the user, which has an email, which is going to be the unique identifier or the primary key of this user entry and the password. Once that is done, I can then instantiate my storage system. And with end storage, you need to pass a directory inside your file system where the data is going to be stored. Once that is done, I can create a salt because we are going to then seed the database with our first users. So you don't need to register every time you want to test it. And this is going to be Steve. I am Steve. Then Steve is going to set up the very secure password 123123. And that's it for us to test. And so now we have our database with a user. Other than that, we have a few database actions we need to talk about. And we're going to skip the email and password validation. And we're going to focus on how to get all the users and how to get the user by email. To get all the users, we're actually just going to query our database. In this case, it's the unstorage API for get item. And then in our get user by email, we're going to filter from the get all users, the one that matches the email we have. So if anything matches, we're going to return the user. If nothing matches, we're going to return no. We also have another method that's for checking if the user has an account. And that account is going to then fetch the user by email, so the one before, and it's going to just return a Boolean. If either it's going to coerce it, if it's an object, so a valid user is going to return true. If it's not, it's going to return false. Finally, we need to allow our users in or to register. So the login function is going again, try to fetch a user with that email first. And if there's no user found, we can just stop everything right then and return an error. Otherwise, we create a hash from the password the user submitted, and we compare those hashes. If the passwords don't match, then we need to return an error to let the user know they entered the wrong password. And finally, we can return the user. For registration, what we're going to do is first check if the user exists. If there's already a user, they cannot register anymore. Otherwise, we create a salt. We set up the hash, we pull all the data, we append it to the data, and then we create the new user. Now we can go through our auth. And in the auth, we are going to set up some actions that the user is going to do. So first we have the auth user action, and it's going to trigger the data that the user sends upstream from that form. And as you can see, the form has two fields, one for email and one for password, but we're also getting a third one. The third one is a hidden input that's going to change the value based if the user is registering or logging in. And then if any of the data is missing, that means the user somehow submitted a bad entry and we're going to return an error. If everything is all right, then we are going to check based on that form type. If it's a login, we're going to call login. If it's not, we're going to call register, which are the two methods we just saw before. And if the type of user, in this case, we didn't get an email, that means there is an error. We can throw it. Otherwise, we're going to set the user with a new session and redirect them to the protected route. When we're redirecting them from the pro to the protected route, 
we are going to revalidate the two sec the two methods that can bring back user data for us. So the get logged user and the get session user, which is going to then, as we just created a new session, we need to revalidate that session. So let's talk about sessions. So we have first this method called use session that comes from Vinci. And we are going to then create our get session server function that's just going to pass our session secret to this use session hook. And in then our get session user, we're going to basically just grab the session. And if there is a user, we're going to return its, the, the data. If there's not, we're going to return null. And we're going to pass then a key for this cache. Then we have the set session, which is basically, again, just grabbing the session and updating that with a value that we want for our user. And finally, the terminate session, which is going to then fill our set, update our session with a blank user. And then we have the user module, which is going to help us manage the user straight from the UI. The first method is the get logged user, which is a server function that's going to call that get session user that we talked before. And then from the email that exists in the session, it's going to grab the user from my database. If there's a valid user, it's going to then return it inside that object. If there is not, it's going to throw them back into the login page, which in this case in this is the root. And then we set this cache key. We've been seeing this cache key in a few other server functions throughout this video. And the reason for that is to deduplicate not only the requests, but also the artifacts that are coming back to the client. So during the same round trip, this request is not going to be fired more than once. And that's why we need to revalidate every time we're going to change the session because we want it to fire if it's already fired once, but we changed it. We want to revalidate it. And finally, we have the logout action, which is going to then terminate a session. So if you remember, it's that method that's going to erase the data that I have in the session and then revalidate both the get logged user and the get session user. So that means in revalidating is that I don't need to worry about um, redirecting my user or not, because these methods, if they're firing again, they're going to happen, which means that if I log in and I am in a protected route, when I log out, it's going to revalidate the get logged user and I'm going to get thrown out of the protected route. But if I'm logged in and I am on a public route and I log out, it's going to revalidate only the get session user and then I'm not going to be thrown anywhere. Now we're good to go. We can go to our front end. So close the libraries and this routes, as you can see, we have a few shenanigans here. So the first one you're going to see is that we have a root file and it's being shadowed by a root directory. This means that this file behaves as a layout. This file is going to wrap everything that every route that is inside the root route. And so what I have here is a preload. And this preload is going to make every time I come, I come to this route, this get logged user is going to be prefetched. Um, so it's going to be fetched as soon as possible. And then by the time I start rendering this, this probably is going to already have arrived. And then we'll have a defined user. Other than that, there are a few stuff over here that's going to be like this boilerplate with the navigation and some other stuff. And then the login logout button, which is this nice little button over here. You're going to see that by the moment that I log in, it changes to logout. So this is the action that I can log in or log out. And this is going to handle the this logic. We're going to pass the user straight up to this button. And then what this button does is receives my my user as my whole user accessor. So it's a getter for this user. And then if the user has an email, I'm going to render a form that the action is the logout uh, action that's going to terminate and redirect them to the login page. 
And every time we create an action, this needs to be a post. And then this button is just submitting that form that has this action. If I don't have a valid user, then I'm going to render the fallback, which is just a link to the login page. So even if I am at another route, for example, this public one that says I'm not logged in, I can click login and I come back over here so I can log in. And then it's going to render all the children from that directory, the root directory. And the root directory has an index, which is my wrapper route for the login, with, that is that component we're seeing over here that's handling the registration and login. So let's jump in. So this component actually using a bunch of primitives that are coming from Cobalt and Solid UI. And I also have this form field, which is going to take the form type, either login or register, and the status. The form type is going to then, for this one, is going to define a hidden input. And that's the thing that's going to sneak into our form data by telling which kind of data is being submitted, a registration or a login data. So the user doesn't really know, and this is not entirely connected to the signal. This is in connected to the HTML platform. This helps us by allowing it to, be, uh, to work even without JavaScript in this case. Then I have a text input that's just wrapped in another component for styles and a password. Finally, we have a redirect to input for whenever we're without JavaScript, it's going to then tell where the form should send the user. And we have a class list that's going to use the, form, the status from the use submission, that there's another video for it. And then it's going to either make it uh, a not allowed or add some other stuff to this. The wrapper, which is the login, is going to then create this submission with the use submission helper and is going to pass the action auth user, which is the one we already created. And then the, there is like the, the handlers for the tab that's coming straight from Solid UI and the form, which is the same form, has the same action for both registration and login. The only difference is that one sends the hidden input saying login, the other one sends it send, uh, with register. And then the same form field, we're passing the login stage, uh, the login status, and the same again for the register. The only thing that changes is some copy. And that's it for our login page. So with that, we have protected routes that we cannot access. It's going to then, in this protected route, every time we're going to get grab a logged user, and then if there is no logged user, as you can see, we're going to get redirected to login. So we cannot go to this page while logged out. Other than that, there's also a defer stream, which makes sense that's going to hold the navigation until the get logged user comes back. So I cannot access protected while the request is in flight in any situation. Then I'm only I'm going to show uh, a table with my user and my email if I am on the protected route. So in this case, by logging in, I get straight into the protected route and then the protected route says it is like that and I get my user email over here. I also added a second route, which is a public one. As you can see, if I am in the public route, it's not a protected route, but we are logged in. And so we have access to the login data. The way we do that is by not protecting the route. So we grab the user from the session instead of grabbing the logged user. So we grab the user that exists on the session and then that doesn't throw redirect if it's false and so on. And other than that, it's basically just the same logic as before. Where I just only in this case, because there's no defer stream, I have a suspense over here. So it's going to then hold the, the rendering while the request is in flight in this case. So now it's time to wrap it up. And push it straight up. And that was it. I hope you have liked it. If you're going through the Solid Docs and you have any other questions, let me know in the comments below or find me in the Solid Discord. I'm always lurking around there. And if nothing else, I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.